Okay, everybody, welcome back. And uh, today I have some uh, I call them mini lectures because they're all on different topics. Um, so we're going to cover uh, UDP TCP networking. We're going to cover the file download stuff that I was trying to run last time. Uh, so I'm going to save that one for last, just in case it corrupts my computer again. Actually, it wreaked habit all over the place. Uh, but this time I have the hello localization. So I want to talk about localization first then go through in a localization example for you that I have already uploaded for you so you can download the source code and look at it and I have the emulator running on this and it's running right now so it's not gonna it's not gonna hang it's not gonna, not gonna cause issues alright so you've built an application and you're thinking that perhaps you're gonna write to support different languages Android has a built-in feature for this that does not require you to hard code uh, different in fact you don't actually have to manually do anything. All you do is create different strings, different string XMLs, different graphic directories, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. And you can either auto detect, if you don't do anything, it will automatically detect which localization is set on a particular phone. And I'll show you how to do that, actually change the location. And automatically transform your app into the appropriate language. Um, if you create an app and only include one language, English, and you have one string file, it will always show in English. If you create different strings for different languages but label them for different platforms, it won't show them. <laughs> so I'll show you an example of what this looks like. So it's, it's kind of hard to, to see it in our PowerPoint. So that's why I was hoping that example is going to run it. It does. So I've got it running. So the goal is to learn how to localize an application. Localize means to make it appropriate for the particular language and the settings on the phone. The emulators, the current emulators, um, are a little bit buggy, so I went back a few generations. I went back to a 1.5 Google emulator to test this with. If you run the same app on a current emulator, 4.03 or 4.0, it sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't work, which is kind of weird. The settings for how to change the localization on the phone on some models are gone completely. On some models, they're all over the place. Uh, so the ways you turn it on, turn it off vary from phone by phone, hardware by hardware, uh, and emulator by emulator. My VirtualBox emulators don't have anything in there to change the localization. And I'll show you that in a few minutes as well. All right, so localization means to make it, uh, make it, you know, per per local. Um, I mean, per different language. So in the resource directory, we've got our strings.xml file and the strings.xml file. In this particular example, we've got, and this is a different example actually, um, we've got a bunch of strings identified here, a dialogue text, a dialogue um, title, and this is what we're looking at in terms of this example that you've been staring at. This is the dialogue, so we've got some text in the dialogue window, a dialogue title. We have some text that shows up on the screen and a flag. And so if you're following along with this example, if you change the localization from, looks like, uh, London to Canada, you're going to get a different flag that shows up. Instead, on my example, I've got different pictures of maps that show up. And in the drawable flag.png, so we have images that show up on the screen with text messages, uh, which is essentially what I've got shown as well in my example. And in terms of the localization, what we're looking at is local codes that are associated with different languages. And these are the codes here. And I'm, you're going to see them and how they're applied towards the drawable directory and also towards the strings. You set the different locale code. It gets picked up automatically by the locale code that's set on the phone in the menu for the local, local uh, localization setting. And it's a setting, usually. It ends up in the settings menu. And it translates everything and uses the appropriate images and uses the appropriate strings for the appropriate items automatically for you. The best and easiest way to set localization. There are some people that like to do it in the program itself. You know, like you have a button that says, you know, switch to this language, switch to that language. You can do it. So I'm going to show you both programmatically as well as automatically. Um, so we can change the locale here to U.S., Spanish, Spain, Venezuela. It depends on how the settings are set. You can actually, on your phone, you can actually create different custom localizations as well. So you know, someone is playing with a phone, I hear. <laughs> How appropriate. All right, so I know, so I guess to say mini PowerPoint, it's like five slides long, basically getting the concept across to you. Um, so the source code is what we're interested in looking at today. 
Um, so let's see. I've created a project called Localization Example. And uh, this source code is available for you. Let me show you where it is before I forget, because I have a tendency to forget to tell you. If you go into the Android Phone Application Development Directory and you look into this uh, course, excuse me, Supplemental Notes, Supplemental Notes section, and you go down at the bottom, here's the localization example. And if you're looking for, and I forgot to point it to you, but if you're looking for the SMS messaging example that we went over, I believe on Tuesday, or excuse me, Monday, when we had to, two emulators that we were sending messages back and forth between them, all of the examples are here, and the maps are here, and so forth. Uh, so, if you unzip the uh, directory, open up the file, load it up into Eclipse, you're looking at a fairly simple program, and here it is here. And I'll show you the simple program first. I've commented out some code because this is how you do it programmatically. Instead, what we're looking at is one, two lines of code, two lines of code that end up in the activity. So you can see, and this is the only class file that is part of this project. So you can see you've got the onCreate, and it's a no-brainer. And what are you doing? We're using a main layout. That's it. We're not setting any localization. We're not doing anything at all. Instead, uh, we're just loading up the main layout. What is in the main layout? If we look in the resource directory and we look under layout, we only have one layout, by the way, and it's main.xml. That supports all of the different localizations that we're going to set. In the main layout, uh, rendering target is still loading. Uh, okay, here it is. Shows a picture, if you're in the U.S., shows a picture of the globe. Underneath it, it's going to say, you are here. <laughs> and we have a title bar that shows up on the top. The layout in this particular sample is uh, nothing more than a, it's a relative layout, which is actually kind of nice, uh, because it kind of demonstrates that, although it's not really using very much, I'm not really using those features. It could very well have been a, any other type of layout. Um, text view to show the label that says, you are here. And uh, this is where the uses of the strings comes in handy. So if you do follow proper programming practice and you actually use the strings, then you have the UR here located in the string library. You didn't hard set it here, which is one of the reasons why you get all those warning messages every time you load up an, a, a, an XML file and you look at it and it says, well, why does it always bug me? Like, why does it always... Because in order for the local, localization features to work, and some of the other things actually, um, if it's in a string, it can easily be found, easily be switched over. So I'll show you the string in a few minutes. But in strings, we have the info text. We're setting the color. Actually, we could set the color as a color flag as well, which we've done here. And when we do that, we can change the color. So the color of white could be different for each location as well if we wanted to, although white's white, isn't it? Um, and so uh, the rest of it is pretty, uh, pretty standard. We have an image view. The image view is using a, a drawable icon, a PNG file called background. The background is that world globe that we saw, and that's for the US, actually. So if I go over and I take a look and say, well, what are these items that I'm talking about? If I go into the drawable directory, I'm going to see the background, and the background here is the globe. I believe I have my emulator localization set to Italy, or no, I think it's set to Canada, actually. Let's see. Canada, here. So each one of these directories, and you might notice, what we've seen so far in the default projects were drawables with extensions for different uh, you know, HDML, you know, HD something or other, VGA something or other, different screen types, different resolutions. Believe it or not, what ends up happening is it'll look in the default. If it's not in the default, it will pick one for the best resolution. So you can actually store, and we haven't seen this yet, but you can easily demo it yourself, store different image qualities in the different directories to support on different devices. Now every day, you know, the phones themselves are becoming very compatible, <laughs> you, know? you know. It's not the fact that, you know, older phones used to not support as high graphic resolution as some of the newer ones do. Now everybody's using a newer, so and it hasn't really grown that much, but in the old days they used to use it for that. In here now we have the possibility of, let's say for example, having a drawable background. And what you see in these directories are drawable back, background.png files. 
you have to label them the same way because main.xml is using background. So they all have to have the same name. They have to have the same extension type as well. And you just load them into the different directories because depending upon what the locale statement is in the settings, it's going to go over here and use the one that's appropriate to it. So if it's, uh, I believe the Italian one is pretty cool. Uh, so here, here's Italy. <laughs> so it sh basically shows different pictures for the different regions, uh, depending upon what you have it set to. Okay, so outside of the drawable images, I mean, there's just one image that we're putting up. Obviously, you could have the icon for the program. You can have the text for the program name, everything associated with it, and the string file for the text. So if I look at the values, I have three different values set, French, Italian, is that Russian? I think that's Russian, actually. If I double click on the Russian, for example, it is Russian, actually. The color white is defined in here as an RGB code. Now, when I say for Russian, do they have a different white? I don't know. <laughs> but the color white could change. You would use the keyword white in the XML file as an example. Right? Um, let me go back to that XML file so you see what I'm talking about. In here, we have white defined as color. So it's a color tag that's white. So we put white in here. We've defined white as the RGB code. And the RGB code we just got from the internet or you know we just copied it from somewhere. Because this is string, so that's why they can we could. We can put it all in the XML file. We could put this RGB code in the XML file if we wanted to. We're putting it in here because we're going to call it a color and we're going to call it white. Just in case in Russia the white's different. <laughs> I mean, I don't know when it would be. I mean, but you know, some, con some countries have color preferences, you know. If you were like um, doing everything in a solid black or something or red, I don't think red and white and um, white actually isn't isn't for Asian culture isn't white bad? I mean, I don't know for like if you were doing like a wedding brochure thing or something, isn't white not good? I always heard like red red was better. No, that's a myth. Uh, red is best. White is best. No, red. red is yeah. best. So maybe if I were doing an app that was doing a registry for a wedding or something, yeah, I would make things red instead of white or something. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I'll hopefully you understand the point. <laughs> but uh, the application name here. That does not look too familiar. I, I believe this is Russian. Uh, but uh, actually, I don't know what I, which one I clicked into. But uh, if, yeah, it is Russian. Uh, we have some special characters, the info text here is the, what's going to show up on the bottom of the screen. Let's take a look at, uh, you know, we'll look at the, here we got Canada, I believe, is here. Um, oops, I'm going to see the drawable window. Uh, I don't have it here, actually. Here, French. I got some French down here. And I, I have the same things essentially. I have white, I have the info text, and I have the application name here. Application name is Example, <laughs> however you pronounce that. Um, anyway, long story short, this is not a multicultural language experience, however. In the English one, which is the default, we have the location example, then we have the text. You are here. And then we have the color, it's white's white. So we're going to have the white, same white color. And this is the color of the text, actually, in the text box that shows up. All right, so hopefully you can sort of see the lay of the application here in terms of what's being accomplished. And uh, if I run the application, let me run, uh, I've got it running, actually. I tested it this time. It's running in the emulator here. And uh, it's uh, Canada, so I think I have this sent, sent for a French. Uh, so the Canada flag is coming up and I see the French which is associated with it. And you're wondering, well, where did that come from? Well, let me show you how you set the phone. We'll put it on English and I'll run the English one so you can sort of see it change. But I basically, before the class started, I ran this application. Um, on most of the phones in the old days, it used to be in the settings icon. Now, actually, on the emulators for Android, it's in a separate one, and I just clicked on that kind of fast, so let me just show you what I did. If you're running with the 2-point to 4-point emulators, you're going to see it, and this is supposed to be a local, 
preferences or something. When I change it to English, we can actually see what the title is. But you can see I've set the locale to French, I believe, on here. But we'll take a look here. It says it on the top, actually. Yeah, I set it to FR French, which means it's using FR. Here it is right here. It's using this guy right here. Um, no, that's France. It's not using that one. Anyway, it's using one of these other ones I've got set up. I think I've got two of these, actually. But long story short, it's using the appropriate language, but let's just put this on English so we can read the titles here. Here we have English. And these were, okay, so just so you can kind of see the relationship here. We have English, R, C, A, English. So we can see on the left-hand side where I have my mouse here. You can actually kind of see on the top here if you look at the, the FR French. These are the notations that I'm using out here. Problem is, I'm going to tell you this is kind of tricky, actually it doesn't work on all devices equally, is that these notations in the phone OS change. <laughs> these are the older ones. This example will work best on older emulators. If I run this on the floor, I don't even get this menu anymore. It doesn't even exist, which is kind of a bummer. And uh, it used to be, in the old phones, you'd go to settings, language, and keyboard, and select the language. In some phones, you went to settings, locale, and text, and set the locale. In the emulators, and in some phones, you actually have this icon that appears in the applications category that lets you set the locale. Now, there's actually auto setting of the locale. For the carrier, when you actually set the OS when they give it to you on the phone, if it happens to be a phone that was done in a different, uh, you know, in a different um, area that supported a different language and they didn't speak English there, they spoke something else, and the phone was originally programmed for that, it picks it up as that automatically. Um, so, and unfortunately, um, along with that came some consistency in terms of the naming, which is good, but unfortunately, you can't really determine what every customer is going to have. So you're going to hopefully not have this problem in about five years from now, four years from now, when all of the old legacy phones are gone. <laughs> or you're hopefully you're not going to have people in the U.S. who are using American phones with settings that are non you know, older APIs with settings that are of, of non-standard labeling. So let me put this back on English so we can read this here. Uh, let's put it on U.S. English. There we go. I'm holding down, actually. Uh, how I'm changing in here, and I'm hitting apply. So now I'm up here, I'm on US English. I can add a new location in here, but who's gonna, what programmer, well, excuse me, what phone person is gonna have you do that? What, to, map, to meet your map, your app, so your app works. However, your app can add this in automatically. So if you wanna solve problems, not have to worry about support, you have the app create the custom locale for you. You set it to the custom locale. If you know you're working with a particular market that's going to need something. So it's definitely one of those things where it's kind of per app kind of thing. So now if we look at the icon here, uh, that's the map example. Now we should uh, custom, custom locale. Uh, what was it called? I think it's called, uh, hold on one second. That I set no, custom locale is actually the name of the icon on this particular emulator. Does not the same icon does not appear, and it's not always called the same thing on every emulator. But this is the Google emulator actually that supports it. In fact, the regular emulator will support it as well. So now, if I run that app, it should automatically switch for me. And the app I'm running was location example, and you are here. Of course, this is too big. Yeah, it's a little sloppy with my image. But this does say you are here down here in English, and it says location example up here, and now we see the globe that was supposed to be for the U.S. that shows up. So we can kind of switch back and forth um, on the fly in terms of uh, the implementation there. Okay, so if we don't want to have the phone determine its own location, and we want to say we're going to distribute this app, and I'm going to, I'm going to distribute this app to the Italian market, I can create a string in this particular example and call it uh, language to load. <laughs> and this is going to be ITRIT -I -T for Italian. And I'm gonna, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uncomment this code. I created some other strings. This is also in the downloaded file that you can take a look at. What this is doing is it's showing you how to create a locale object and load in the language to load. So depending upon which one you select, 
Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see what I'm talking about. So you, I created a generic string called language to load, and this is going to load everything in Italian for me. And I believe I have Italian over here, I hope. I do, right here. And this is matching the code. You can see I have these other codes as other examples you can play around with. So locale, locale equals new locale. So I'm creating a new instance of the object locale, and I'm setting the default to this locale. So my application, by default, will go to this locale. So even if my phone understands English and shows English, which it does right now, actually, when I run this app, it's going to show Italian. <laughs> so where are you? Or you are here, or whatever is going to be in a different language. I didn't set the image, however. I just set the text. So you're going to see how the image should show up as a globe, actually, because that's what the American default. I only set the locale of the text. So configuration, configuration, I make a new configuration. What is this? This is part of the configure language locale configuration, which is an, configuration is an object for the configuration settings on the phone. So I'm actually creating the, the locale object if it doesn't exist already. Um, so the locale is going to be equal to locale, which is a custom configuration. So remember when I pressed that button and I said add locally add the this is how you would actually add it to the list which means if it's not on there it's going to be on there so in fact if I go through I'll see this one on the list and it's actually labeled a bit differently than the rest of them that are in there on the list so get base code context get resource which is nothing more than getting the resources of the phone to get the configuration settings to update the configuration and the configuration that's being updated is going to be the resource to display get display metrics which is essentially going to be the method that updates the display and the display update is what's going to be showing the different locale so once I load it create the object I'm saying oh update it update the configuration update the resource so that it will show correctly and then I set the view was the same as before same line of code as before so now if I run it I should see um, Italian um, in terms of the words in there, and hopefully I'm going to be able to run it here um, successfully twice. Actually, I ran it twice. Right? This will be the third time. Third time's a charm. Looks like it's loading. Very good. Installing. Very good. That's the old one that was up here. It should be putting the new one on. Well, okay, I can't see it because my image is blocking it, but that's not English. <laughs> That's Italian. Um, my application title still says location example, though. I didn't actually change that. I just changed the text, the string. So that code customized the string setting for me. The problem that you have when doing it programmatically is you have to make sure you set everything. <laughs> so it's a little bit more work than automatically just relying upon the phone settings. However, it's a little bit safer. If I know that this phone is going to show Italian, it's not going to show any English, then I go through and I make sure I have everything set. And if I'm going to do that, my default's going to be Italian everywhere. So, you know, that's one choice you have. So, unfortunately, you have many different choices, and with choices becomes headaches because, you know, what if I don't change the images correctly? What if I don't change it? You know, anyway, so you have certain, certain scenarios that might appear, so... Um, that's actually, believe it or not, everything you ever wanted to know about localization. That is, that is the entire localization feature on the Android phone. Not, not very tough, but it sort of explains why in the string, excuse me, why in the layout, you always get those warnings that say, this should be a string, that should be a string, and you should use strings for everything, because then you have the option of using localization features. And that's just, um, you know, just pretty much the basic concept in terms of why you, in fact, the other thing too is, you know, for example, I'm, I've, this application was bought by a company and they want to change the name. If it's in the string, I change it in one spot. If it's all over the place hard coded, I have to change it everywhere, which is kind of hard. So here, if I just go to the string file, I can just change it. And all of a sudden it's changed everywhere in the application. So. All right, last time, and let's, uh, I'm going to move on, unless we have questions. Localization? No? Yeah? Okay, good. And that example is downloadable and runnable. And you don't have to program, you don't have to program with localization, so you're in luck. 
we have this download file example that I was trying to demo last Monday and it's running on a 2.3 emulator and uh, I'm gonna shut this one down because this is a 1.5 emulator you don't need the Google one you can load it on any emulator that you want I'm gonna try and start it and then lecture in the background and see what happens <coughs> In fact, I'm sort of going to run it on a current one. I have to load it, and as I was saying before, I have to load it on an emulator that has an SD card. Because when you download, the only memory that you have, your hard disk space that you're downloading to, is your SD card. Um, so this particular example that I went through, all the way through actually, to the point where I was trying to demo it, wouldn't run. Uh, it was locking my computer up. So I added a SD card to one of my AVD4-2 which I showed you guys with a text messaging example. So I believe that the program should be running on this. So while this is loading in the background, I'm going to continue on to another topic. So we're going to visit, revisit this in a few minutes unless my computer dies. Oops, wrong lecture. Just went through that one. So that was localization, threads, and networking. <laughs> Hello threads is part of another topic, and this kind of comes along with what I was talking about today with the uh, Java course and thread programming. The same capabilities, the same capabilities for networking exist on the um, Android phone as they do in regular old Java API, and these are the same libraries, and the same information I gave you earlier. So if you're not taking the Java course, if you look at the lecture that was given today on the same date, the video will show you all of the Java.net I/O and all of the streams and the differences between UDP and TCP, and I'm not going to bore you guys with that stuff again. Instead, I'm going to show you how it's done on the Android phone. <laughs> so. Um, there's a hello threads example and we can create an application that uses a background thread such as a UDP server to receive messages from a UDP client. This is practically the same example that I gave you guys earlier but it's code that was designed for the Android. And I'm gonna assume that I probably don't need to run it unless you guys want to see it and if you do want to see it I have to run it on Monday because I don't have the example with me right now and I couldn't I thought it was supposed to be uploaded and I couldn't find it. But I do have it, it's just not on my site, I don't have it on this computer. Does anybody want to see it? Or maybe I should wait till I'm all done to ask that question. I'll wait till I'm all done. <laughs> then if people have an interest in actually seeing it run, then we'll do it on Monday. But the, uh, the program essentially is a client server that uh, the server loads up, it sits there and waits, and then another phone, as a client, connects to it through a UDP connection, the same way as you were opening up two DOS prompts and loading it up from a command prompt. And this sort of looks like a command prompt console as well. Uh, so we have the last message sent from a UDP client that may have come in. And here we have the you know, server started, its server IP address, which is kind of common actually. So we could create some text views in this particular case. We have a text view, it changes from starting server to server started. It's kind of optional. But if you're going to design something, you usually want to know whether or not the server thread started correctly. When you load the project up, your UDP, and you have a UDP server that's connecting to a UDP client, vice versa. So you really are interested in knowing the IP address, if anything. So that part, and uh, the interesting part was, you know, we have a port and an IP address in a regular old Java application. And here we just basically have to work with the IP address. So the text we hear that shows the IP address of the server is needed for the UDP client to connect to it. So if you're testing this yourself, you're probably going to write that down or something. And then we have a little box here, a clear button that's going to clear the last message and show the interface. Uh, shows that the interface is still responsive, essentially, that this hasn't frozen. And uh, then we have the text view underneath it. The text view underneath is going to show what happens when the client sends server something. This is on the server end, by the way. In terms of the application's constructors and the way that the structure is built, we have the main activity, we have a server thread, and we have a UDP client, which is also running sort of as a thread as well. The hello threads 
is one kind of unit that's going to connect. So we have a one client program and one server program. The main activity on the server is going to, in the on create. We have the create the thread, start the thread, which is going to happen in the constructor because essentially that's what happened in the application that we ran earlier. We created a new, uh, you know, we basically created a new socket. So this is going to do the same thing. It's going to open a socket if successful. It's going to say it started the server. Find and display the address. So we're still creating a socket, and we're still using the socket class. And we're still using java.io and java.net, believe it or not. It's the same packages, same library. It's just showing you that you can also do this on a mobile device. And then we're going to have a message handler. The message handler is going to basically um, give us uh, the ability to work with situations either from errors or from messages from clients and vice versa. We're also going to have an onDestroy method to close the socket, which is sort of like the close. And then we have an on click listener method. And you notice here we have these things housed in methods that are from the life cycle. So if you remember the Android life cycle. Um, and if you haven't done it, the midterm will remind you of that, I believe, or the CSLO. And hopefully you guys are working on that stuff. So the life cycle has these methods in it automatically. And you should hopefully be familiar with the on create by now. And then in, ter in terms of the run, the run is essentially going to be from the on create. And the run is, it, that's a thread thing. That's a, that's a, that's, that comes from uh, traditional style Java programming, uh, where in terms of, you know, while the socket is still open, receive a packet, display the message, and send a reply. Essentially, it's sort of setting that set, uh, what do you call it, the state machine kind of concept where the server is just going to sit there, open the, open the, create the socket, bind it to the IP address, and sit there and wait for a client to attach to it. Over on the UDP client side, and uh, we're going to read a line from the input. We have to send a message, essentially, to the server. Uh, send a line to the server. Read the line back from the server. Display the line, essentially, is what this sample app is going to do. And that's on the UDP client code. So here's sort of like what the source code, in fact, this good example of what the source code would look like. Um, sort of an easy to follow kind of fashion. And what you're doing is you're getting the concept out of this, hopefully. So we have the, the data members, class members, the text view, the button, the server thread, which is going to be a thread, my thread. So server thread <coughs> is, uh, can actually, you can actually, this is like server socket, but it's server thread. It's actually depreciated. It's equivalent to the server socket. The handler, the handler is defined uh, coming up next, but it's similar to the handler concept that we've seen already. The onCreate is going to get the handles from the GUI elements and create the server thread, do with the thread, you know, creating new essentially with my thread equals new. And then the server thread is going to basically work with the hand, be bound to the handler. We're going to start the thread with a start, which is, you know, the way that we're going to initialize it. And then we're going to register the onClick listener for the clear button. You know, it's kind of standard. And then on the destroy, we're going to close the socket. This is the same code we actually saw before opening. But um, the syntax is slightly uh, slightly different in this slide because it's coming from an older API, actually. And then we're going to clear the last message. by uh, The onclick listener is going to clear the message. So the handler. Um, we're going to see handlers actually in a database example that's coming up on uh, Monday. I believe I have data... I don't think I've covered the database stuff with you guys yet, the database uh, creation. But uh, generally what ends up happening is you have an activity, and the activity has a handler, and the handler does all of the low-level reads and the writes and the um, performing of the tasks for the main activity. It's nothing more than separating the workout and making a new instance of the handler and reusing the handler for every type of application. So in this particular case, we could reuse this handler in any networking application that we wanted to do, we just include the class. And it could be, you know, of any term. And you do this with databases for SQL commands and things because to send an SQL command to receive a result set, to parse something, to connect to something, to disconnect to something, it's pretty standard across every application that you're going to build. So if you have a separate activity, which is really your main program, and you have a separate handler, then you just reuse the handler every time you create a new application. So here we're going to handle, the handler here is just nothing more than handling messages. 
uh, for this particular application. So it's going to switch message one as a packet came in. We're running. We have an IP address. IP address is good or bad. I've set the IP address. Um, so we have a case switch coming through, and the handler has got a message being sent to it when it's invoked, and the message is something that's going on in terms of the communication. Uh, so here we're going to take and create a string out of the message object. So we have a packet that came in. Well, we have to treat it like a message. So the last message, we're going to set the text. So if this particular event occurs, and this is very event driven, um, so this is the same thing that sort of happens with the SQL example because if there's no results, it's going to come back and say, I say empty, you know, send, a, send a message to the client or toast message that says, hey, result says empty, no, no records. Uh, so if we get a packet that comes in, we're going to parse the message out. We're going to show the message on the text box. This is, hey, we have this incoming message. If it's running, we're just running, then we're going to set the, the socket status to running. We're, we're running now. And it only gets really sent once, essentially, because the server just starts up and runs once. In terms of the IP address, we can set the IP address to show the IP address from the socket. So my IP address dot two string is going to come out of the init address my IP address. This is the same code, believe it or not, we saw in the previous lecture, um, setting an IP address object. In fact, we can use the URL object as well, get all the information from the URL object. One of the previous examples I gave you for the web view used a URL and a connection object actually as well. If you guys remember that example, it took and uh, created a URL, went out to the internet to get an image and downloaded the image um, and so that's the download example that I'm going to show you when I get done with this lecture. That should hopefully, if it's not running, it's never going to run. Hopefully it should be running in the background here. We'll see. Uh, so for the server thread, we have the class server thread that extends thread. This is the interesting part here. So it's extending thread, not activity, not because it's running as a thread. So here's the interesting thing and before I mentioned, you know, the life cycle of the app of the app. One thread runs constantly. Kind of mis misleading because it's the activity that runs, and then we have another activity, and we switch it with the with intent. So we can actually spawn threads and have multiple threads running, believe it or not. However, they're called well, they turn into background threads. They're not foreground applications, and the threads don't actually run as applications. They run as Java threads. So they're sort of treated a little bit differently. You can't switch back and forth between threads like you can an application. And you can't, they just, the thread doesn't have the same life cycle as the application. And it's not controlled by the JVM or DB, the bulk manager that's on the phone itself. So it kind of violates the applet kind of concept in some ways. But here we're seeing that, uh, yeah, an applet, you know, Java program can, can basically create a thread Thread is similar to a running process, right? From thread length, thread programming. So in terms of the class members, we'll have the handler, the context, so the application, the link to the application context. We need the context actually to get from the thread to the running program, because the context is actually the activity that's running, that spawned the thread that's running. So <laughs> kind of interesting. The datagram socket, if you remember what I said, this is a UDP example. So we've got datagrams are going back and forth. And then we have the server thread here, which would be the constructor for the method, X constructor method for the class that's going to basically set all the data members, open up the socket, and check to make sure it's, it's, you know, it's running correctly, update the status to running, update the IP address to its current IP address where it happens to be sitting, and then... Um, obtain messages from the address and we'll see that in the next slide. And then we have a close close the socket and then we have a void run. So the void run is actually not very I I not very applet standard either actually. So so let's see here. So getting the IP address we can get my wife actually you can run this method. In fact you can create this from a hello world app, app, application and get my Wi-Fi address and run that method. And what you're going to get is the Wi-Fi address of the phone. So instead of having to do like an IP config or something like that, actually get it. You can actually run this method and get it. So to get the Wi-Fi address, you just run this essentially. Show it on. The, this is how we're basically populating the, the form with the address. 
So Wi-Fi Manager, my Wi-Fi. And this is interesting because if you've been following along with the last couple of things, we've had a SMS Manager, Location Manager. We have a Wi-Fi Manager now. Wi-Fi, well, that's part of the services of the phone. So we have a Wi-Fi Manager object. The Wi-Fi Manager object, we can get all the information about the Wi-Fi, the address, how long it's been connected, the carrier, how many bytes are currently being transferred and received. What, what is the transfer rate? You know, all this information comes from the Wi-Fi manager. Just the same way as the location manager gave us, gives us our longitude and latitude. We can set good. We can actually set that through, and we have limited, but not too many capabilities through the DDMS, actually. So, uh, let's see, Wi-Fi info uh, from the Wi-Fi info. We're creating an info object, and the info object we got to get connection info. DC, DHCP info, DHCP object. Wow, look at that. We can get the DHCP info. We can get all this information from built-in objects that we're making instances of that are features of the phone, actually, built into the API. So it's pretty, pretty nifty, actually. If you were writing this application on a regular Java environment, you would take more lines of code because <laughs> you'd actually would have to create different objects and actually dig in there to sort of get and apply this object to that object to sort of get the information right you're looking for. But here we just create, get the info, get get everything you want. So we got to try and catch down here on the uh, my integer on the address itself. So we're we're going to get the address from the in, uh, init address, which is going to be from a get my get by address with some coordinates for the Wi-Fi signal. So and now we're going to return the address, and then we're going. This is a a log essentially is going to show up in the DDMS manager under the log screen on the bottom. We can tag it, and this is the tag that we're going to associate with it on the log, and the log is going to say, can't get my own IP address, which means there was probably some security set on the phone that turned uh, made it unavailable, or you're not connected and you don't have a Wi-Fi address, which may also be the other case. So on the server thread dot run, and this is a kind of the non-standard run method that can run on here. We can check this to make sure we have the socket. So socket OK is equal to true as long as we get we don't get any socket errors. We've got a socket established. And it's usually an on or an off. There's no way of troubleshooting that. So usually you put it in a try and catch and say create a socket. Or, you know, if you can't create the socket, it's probably a memory issue or you don't have any ports open security settings, some firewall software might close off all the ports, may actually disable your ability to create a socket. This application would probably not work on a phone that had any security, <laughs> that actually had settings were blocked and content was blocked and everything was shut down on it. It would probably not run correctly. Um, so while we actually are able to establish a socket, we're going to do, and this should look familiar, this is the same code we saw earlier, the data ground packet. So we're going to use the same identical code. So we create an instance of the object for the data ground packet. We're going to say receive packet. And we have a send packet and a receive packet. We can send the information. When we receive it, it comes in the form of bytes. And because it's data gram, it shows up in a byte. If we can actually, this is a UDP example. If And I'm not going to go through TCP because it's just... Too, too redundant. If uh, if it were TCP, we'd have a stream, and we would have a string that we could actually send and receive. But this is going to go from the byte level. And then while it's OK, uh, process the information. And if it's not, print a little message to the screen that says something about it being failed or something. Um, so in the manifest, we actually have to turn on a few things to get permissions. What do we have to turn on? We actually, this is a new one. We have to turn on the access Wi-Fi state. Because we're trying to get at the Wi-Fi lo location, or excuse me, Wi-Fi manager. And in order to make an instance and use the Wi-Fi manager, we have to get the Wi-Fi state permission. If we don't have permission, that's not going to work. And the other thing we've seen already is the internet. We need the internet permission uh, because we're using a UDP connection. And so in order to do that, we definitely need the internet on that. So once we um, enable those two privileges, we should be able to run the application. So. Let's see. Back at the ranch, I have my part A of the messaging application. Let's see if it's running. This is the same old thing that hosed my browser last time. It's called download file. 
warning, warning. Uh, no, that's that's a good warning. That's not a bad one. Launching. Okay, let's just. I don't know if this application is ever going to run. Seriously. Well, it's not going to run in this one. All right, so. No luck on this one this time around again. <laughs> I'm still working on a fix to see how I can get that to work. Uh, and this is actually kind of a common scenario when you have to use special features of the emulator, such as the SD card, getting the emulator to load, getting the app to actually run on the emulator <laughs> can be a challenge. Yeah, so you know, if you're experiencing this. So this one it doesn't want to behave. It did not load. Uh, why it did not load? It didn't give me an error message, which is kind of interesting. Um, it could be that um, I don't want to run it again because it, it takes way too much time. Let me just make sure it's not installed on here already. I did try and load it the other day, and it actually did load. Oh, that's the SMS map demo from last time I accidentally clicked on. Uh, this one's called Download File. Uh, Come on. Speech recorder, widget preview. Nope. Okay. No such luck. I was hoping maybe it would have just installed. <laughs> no. All right. So that one's not going to behave. We're not going to see that one. So maybe if I can do it at home into a screen capture of it. <laughs> I know that the thing runs because I've run it before. So. I have one really small lecture I want to give you because it's a continuation of the last one. Oops, it's not this one. This is the threads one I just ran. Is this the same one? Hold on one second. It demos a chat program. Actually, this is this is the continuation of the one, but it, there's a chat program, a chat, a chat application that runs without using a chat service that runs in a client server kind of fashion where multiple chat clients connect to a chat server using UDP and it's an example of why it is you'd want to learn this stuff why does you want to go and use threads and create clients and servers and stuff because in the real world you want to create really big applications like chat and stuff like that you know so for example this particular chat here is a basic chat application that uses Broadcast UDP to send and receive messages on the, the local network. Hmm, Seventy-five percent improve the chat app. Well, seventy-five percent of it's good. Twenty-five percent of it could use some improvements. So here's the issue with here's the um, well. Let me show you the good things about this. If you have an internet server set up that is able to accept a connection from a phone, you can create the server using Java on this particular site, not running through a web page, but just running through a regular you know, client server connection. Um, or you can actually do a web kind of thing on it as well. You can integrate it with a web interface as well. You can have a bunch of mobile phones all over the world sending messages back and forth to other mobile phones. All of the mobile phones are running the client. The client through UDP connection in this particular interface here is demonstrating kind of the concept, the same as a regular old chat. Type in the message, press send, send it to the server. So we have a send it and a receiver, sort of like email. And we have a POP server or an IMAP server that stores it up. X is the router. So you send, one client sends the message and says, this is for phone A and I'm phone B. It sends it to the server. Server says, oh, this goes to phone A. Reroutes it, sends it back to phone A. So it's just a send and a receive back and forth between multiple clients and one centralized server. So you can create accounts for, for users, put it in a MySQL database or something if you wanted to on the server. Um, you can actually create a database out of this if you wanted to, but you don't really even need to at all, actually. You can just keep it in terms of UDP connections. Put together a simple client, put together a simple server, as this example is actually showing, and then send and receive. Problem with this particular environment is that the server always has to be up, obviously. You might have also, you might have server <coughs> overload. Because each new client that attaches to the server opens up a new connection, closes the connection, opens up a connection, closes the connection. Could be kind of slow. Some of the other chat programs that are out there, like Google Chat, Yahoo Chat, all these chat chats, are using TCP. Some of them are using UDP. They're using different kinds of techniques using the same kind of concept. It's all thread programming. And it's all sending and receiving, either UDP or TCP. 
Pros and cons, if you're using the TCP, you're running the battery down on your phone a little bit faster because you have a constant connection and you can sit there and you get instant updates and it runs real quick. If you're using UDP, it doesn't wear the battery down as, as much because it's not connecting constantly. It's not like surfing the internet constantly. <laughs> it's, instead, it's slower. Not quite as real time, but it works sort of like instant messaging. Instant messaging doesn't work real time either. As we saw last time, we create an SMS message. We use the service on the phone to send the message. Message goes out. Five minutes later, <laughs> we get a response. It's not instantaneous. So it's the design, which is that, you know, 25%, you know, could, could possibly be improved. If I wanted to build this particular program, and we have actually kind of seen this in another example, not using UDP, using regular SMS. Um, so I was supposed to give this lecture to you last time, actually, but we're out of order. We have a list view showing both the messages sent and received that would end up over here. We have an edit text allowing users to enter the text to be sent here, a little send button. This is all done. This is not features of the phone. This is the same thing we did last time, actually, on Monday. We saw the program for it. We just didn't do the lecture on it. In terms of the threat, because we're not using the built-in SMS feature, instead we're creating our own. So the application structure, the main activity, the onCreate would create the thread, start the thread. So the constructor would open up a socket. If it was successful, then it would find and broadcast the IP address. And then while the socket's open, it's going to receive messages, and then it's going to display messages. So it can send and receive messages. And instead of just keeping them in text files, it's going to actually put them on a list view, put them in a list box. And then on destroy, it's going to close the socket, and then on the click listener, when you click it, it's going to send a button. You know, on the click, it'll send the message. So it sends UDP messages. So in terms of the main activity for this particular program, our class members are going to be our data members, which are going to be the, the text box, the button, the list view, all of the different pieces of the GUI. Um, an array adapter is going to keep track of all the messages that are coming through. Uh, which is nothing more than attaching an array adapter to a list view, uh, which we've actually seen in the beginning of the course. And then the server thread, uh, that's going to basically uh, be the thread that we're running. And the thread that we're running is behind the GUI. It's just the one that's establishing the socket, or using the socket to send and receive. And then we have the handler, same as before, similar to the last example we looked at. We have one little bit of a uh, change in here. The case with the packet comes in, it's going to actually, instead of um, just printing it to the screen, it's actually going to put it to, you know, you're, you have an incoming message and, you know, put it in your list, add it to a list so you can see the sending and the receiving messages. Then on the onCreate method, uh, we're going to get the handlers for the GUI events, you know, for the GUI elements, essentially, so that we can read and write to the text box and figure out what we're going to do with the uh, button terms of the action. We have the message list, which is that list view. We have the received messages that are coming through, the sending messages. And we're going to register the on-click listener to the button, essentially. Then we have the on-destroy and the on-click listener code to actually uh, perform. The on-click listener is just going to take the message that comes through, receive the message from the datagram packet, take the message, parse it to a string, and put it in the text of the box that's going to display it in the list view essentially. For the server thread, the handler, the datagram socket, which is the same thing as we saw already, and look at that, the server socket, which is the same thing we saw in the previous class, actually, in the Java class. And then uh, we're going to use a boolean for, you know, is it okay, is it not okay, instead of doing, well, we can still put the try and catch in there, but it's just a way of keeping status. You know, did we were able to receive the socket create the socket, or did we get an error? If we got an error, it means the security probably wasn't set correctly. Deal with the address information, broadcast the address, uh, which is a way of sending the address out and say, hey, I'm here. You know, this is my address as a server, so go ahead and send messages to me. So we can send information out to clients who will, might be connected, may not be connected. And uh, then on the server set itself, we're going to do a try on the server socket. And here we're going to use the port information, which would also be the address, the uh, IP address. On the run, it's going to be similar to the other one that we looked at. 
it's going to essentially just create and wait. So the server on the server end is just waiting for those incoming clients. So and then we're going to send packet. It's going to take on the string, which is going to be in the message. It's very similar to the last example that we looked at. And then getting the IP address is identical to the last example that we looked at. So um, this was, you know, the only thing different is this line in red here, uh, which is going to be the my inner broadcast, which is going to take and broadcast out, but it's going to mask it, so it's not um, not, not taking and going, hey, here's my IP address. Yes. In fact, actually, this is, is deciphering the IP address that's on the phone that's already masked. So, And then uh, do a try and a catch, and if we can't read it, I can't get, you know, printed out, I can't get my own address, and this is in the log. Another interesting thing to note is actually when you do uh, distribute this application if you do you're probably you're not going to have any logs you're going to pull out the logs so some improvements to this application your choice of examples uh, you know different improvements are worth a uh, different types of points and um, if you this was used to be based to with an old assignment actually that I had put together um, so ways of differing ways of creating improvements to this would be to play around with the UDP instead of doing it on a TCP, which the example is actually done. Adding names and messages, adding images, adding voices. Um, you know, it'd be nice to actually create an, an app that uh, you know read your text messages to, or read your chat messages to, or something like that, uh, which is actually kind of easy with Google Play, uh, Google Talk, actually APIs. Add preferences to the program. Um, localize it. Lock. You know, put some looks in there, some backgrounds, some icons, make utilities for saving images, saving files. So you can actually add a lot to that kind of concept in terms of sending data back and forth because you have more, if you if you don't use the APIs of the phone and you're not going through the chat services or SMS messaging and you're actually creating your own UDP application, you can send your own data, you can receive, you can actually store it, you can send different things, files, programs. Um, you can do all sorts of different utilities to it that go above and beyond basic SMS messaging uh, as a comparison. So, Do we want more or do we want to go home? <laughs> what did you say? Home? All right, it's unanimous. <laughs> I know that little guy in the beginning kind of ate up some of our time. Don't worry, we're still on target. So we'll end for today. It's 8.04. Next time. What are we going to do next time? We're going to do, I got a bunch of examples saved up for you. Miscellaneous stuff.